Old Testament scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Genesis chapter 19. And before, before I read this, I want to give you just the day of, the day, the night before, somewhere right in there, the prehistory, because I didn't want to read all that. But three, the Lord and two messengers had shown up to Abram the day before and informed him that he was going to have a child and that they were on their way to check out the rumors and the cries of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abram had been hospitable to them, had given them water and fresh bread, had allowed them to rest underneath the oak tree in what is modern day Hebron before they continued on towards that way. And Abraham even walked with them and heard what was going to be happening when they got to the city. So hear these words, starting in chapter 19. The two messengers entered Sodom in the evening. Lot, who was sitting at the gate of Sodom, saw them, got up to greet them, and bowed low. He said, come to your servant's house, spend the night, wash your feet, then you can get up early and go on your way. But they said, no. We will spend the night in the town square. He pleaded earnestly with them so that they went with him, entered his house. He made a big meal for them, even baking unleavened bread, and they ate. Before they went to bed, the men of the city of Sodom, everyone from the youngest to the oldest, surrounded the house and called to Lot, where are the men who are arrived tonight? Lot went out before the entrance, toward the entrance, closed the door behind him and said, my brothers, don't do such an evil thing. They said, get out of the way. They continued, doesn't this immigrant want to judge us? How we will hurt you more than we will hurt them. They pushed Lot back and came close to breaking down the door. The men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house with them and slammed the door. This is God's word to help us, God's people. Thanks be to God. Lot, Abraham's nephew, has traveled with him all the way to Egypt and back into the land of Canaan. They separated and went into two different areas. Abram heading towards what is now modern-day Hebron, where he would live and prosper. His children would grow, and the kingdom of Israel would be birthed into reality. So Lot headed south to two towns in Sodom and Gomorrah into a fertile plain that is, was described as close to the garden of the Lord in its fertility and beauty which means it was close to being as good as the Garden of Eden. And there he pitched his tents, even though the area of that, the people of that area were known to be cruel, sinful, evil people. And as we hear this description now of Lot sitting in the city, he's no longer in his tents. He now must be a leader of the city because that's who sits at the gates welcoming strangers. It is, it was, still is the custom of those ancient cities that if visitors are traveling through, they are welcome to spend the night in the city square. But it is expected, required, that the cities of those towns welcome you into their home in acts of hospitality. take a moment to pray, to ponder, as I unfold this for us today. Let us pray. Lord, I ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon myself, upon those gathered here, upon those who are listening on the internet, to allow us to know and to understand what it is that you are speaking to us to do and to be, how we are to love and to act. Lord, 
allow us to hear and to be your people. Lord, you have laid this message upon my heart, and I ask that I may be able to share it in a way that brings about your desires. So, Lord, come. Be with us. Amen. This scripture lesson, as most of you know, is not one you hear read very often in church. Because too many times people think of it as too controversial, too radical, too unbelievable to do and to deal with because of the way our society and the church and culture have acted and reacted to the events that happened that night and the forthcoming destruction of two cities and the entire wiping out of those populations. It has formed and transformed our culture and our society in ways that is unimaginable and I believe was unconceivable by the writers of the Old Testament. Because yes, it is about sin. It is about listening and doing God's will. But it's not necessarily about any one specific thing. It's about being sin-filled people and how to be grace-filled people, how to be revolutionary in your love and in your hospitality and how to be that kind of person that God wants you to be, even in the midst of evil and sin. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah really represent the majority of humanity represent all of us at some point in time before we knew Christ when we were willing to live in a life that was all about us, all about making the most money, having the most things, enjoying the most pleasure. We didn't care about the, who we stepped on or where we went in order to get what we needed to get. This last Friday you heard Betsy talk about the delegate assembly and we had Tony Campolo come and preach and I, I've listened, I've heard and been with him many times. And I'll tell you, one of his part was the fact that we as a society love our titles. We work for titles. We want to be the CEO, the president. We want to be the chairperson of this committee. We want to be, we want to be known for our titles. And we will take titles upon titles. We'll do whatever we can to get titles of being in the top ten or in the top five, the best dressed, the homecoming court, the you name it, we love titles. But what God loves is testimony. And that is what we hear here in this gospel. Is the testimony of not the best of Abraham's family. In fact, Lot is probably the least of Abraham's family. Because you see, he didn't want to stick around with Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, Abraham and Sarah. He wanted to go off and make his own wealth. He wanted to be his own best person that he could be, and he didn't care what it was going to take. See, he was going to go to the best land. He was going to make the most money, and he was going to be that person. And according to the scriptures, he made it to the point that he was allowed to sit at the gate, which means he was part of the judging and ruling authority of that city. that ability to know when to do something right, even though part of him really wasn't sure how to do it. We see that contrast between chapter 18 and 19. And I'd ask that if you, if you want to take a chance to read chapter 18 in reflection, this, that's when Abraham welcomes the three, the Lord and two messengers, and gives them water, gives them food, gives them rest and does it in a way that is exceptional. Without question, without hesitation, he puts out the best that he has. He walks with them to make sure that they're fine and they're safe. But Abram, or Lot, his nephew, doesn't quite get all of that. So the next day when the two messengers 
show up at the city to investigate the cries of the innocent to find out if there's any good people left that are welcomed by Lot who says you need to come to my house and not be in the square because it's not safe and I'll give you some water and I'll give you some food and in the morning you can get up early and get out of here want to do it. They wanted to find out what's going on in the city, but Lot insisted and they went. Lot was completely and utterly a rebel at that point in time in the city. And we hear that when the people gather outside. It says everybody, every man showed up because they wanted to do evil to these two strangers. And Lot goes out and pleads their case. But you can't do this. You know that this is not the rules of how we live our lives in this area. He makes some offers that are hard for us to understand, but they are offers of hospitality because he would rather have damage to his own family than to these men who he's protecting. But it goes on. It gives us another hint he calls them brothers. He knows these people. He has been and hung out with them. He knows just how evil they are. But they turn on even him. And they say, who are you? You're just a lousy immigrant. You cannot tell us how to act towards other people. Get out of our way, and we will destroy everything. It was at this time that the messengers of the Lord intervened. And they opened that door, and they reached out, and they grabbed Lot, and they yanked him back in the house, and they slammed the door shut. And as you know the story, they stayed safely till morning when they all left. So you may be saying, well, what does that have to do with Asbury United Methodist Church and Bettendorf, Iowa? I mean, you know, nobody, nobody hardly even notices when somebody comes or goes to town and, or things happen and, you know, nobody, you're right. We don't seem to notice when anything seems to happen or goes on in town. We don't seem to notice when a stranger walks into our church and sits down and joins us. We don't seem to notice when there are people living under our bridges or in the shelters or why they're going through the dumpsters outside the restaurants. We don't seem to notice any of that because, you know, that doesn't happen in Bettendorf. We don't notice that we have kids that are on drugs and dying of heroin overdoses. We don't notice when we have people that are so depressed that they harm themselves. We don't seem to notice when Nathan said, even somebody in our own committee stops coming to a meeting. That's not what God is calling us to do. That is not what revolutionary hospitality has to do with it. And as you know, I love the word revolutionary because it has the word love right there at the beginning. Because for us to be revolutionaries, for us to do revolutionary hospitality, we have to start with a love that begins it all, runs through it all, is there right to the very end. So today, my challenge for you is to open your hearts, open your minds, open your eyes and your ears to the things that you've been accustomed to looking past. You may be surprised at what you see. you feel. For you know the love of Christ. And you know that that love within you is dying to get out and love others. So let it out. It's going to be scary. It's going to be hard. Some of you are extremely introverted slash shy. And you don't want to talk to a new person that walks in. 
That's somebody else's job. You see somebody on the street, and it's easy to say, Dierra, work at the center and give them stuff, and we'll help you give them stuff, and we'll, you give them stuff, but don't ask me to go to the thrift center and give them, help them with stuff. Don't ask me to go to the Salvation Army site and work with Churches United to feed them. I'll provide a ham. I'll provide the food. Let me write you a check. Now, not that we don't need all of that stuff, but the real love part comes in scooping out the food, handing out the clothing, giving them the bedding to lay down at night. One quick story that brought this so home to me. My first youth mission trip that I took where I flew youth somewhere, we went to San Francisco. We flew in there to glean peaches, dry them, cut them up, send them off to third world countries. We had had a great week. We were all done. We were doing some sightseeing on the way back. Hit some traffic, missed our flight. And if you know anything about taking the youth mission trips, we took the cheapest flight we could. There was a red eye in the middle of the night. United then went on strike the next morning, and we were stuck. So we got up on Sunday morning, found the closest church that we could get to, and sat there and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed because we were told we weren't sure when they were going to be able to fly us back. That church noticed us there. That church and its members surrounded us at the end of the service wanting to know why I was looking distressed, the kids were looking distressed, the other adult leaders, and we shared with them. And someone stepped forward and said, just come to our house. I spent a week and a half living in this person's house while I, one child at a time, drove them to the airport at midnight on standby and put one at a time on a plane as there was an empty seat until I got everybody back home. This family never asked for anything. They gave me their car keys. They opened up their kitchen. They didn't care. They knew that they were doing what God wanted them to do. They wouldn't even take a donation or a thank you. I've sent flowers and cards to them. I've never heard from them again because it wasn't important to them to be thanked or to be liked. They just did what God needed them to do. And from that moment on, I've been bound to determine that if that ever happens in one of my churches, I have got a room that the kids can stay in and a basement where they can hang out. So far, God hasn't called in on that favor yet, but it's there. And I'm hoping that all of you may find a time and an opportunity to experience it and to do 